It is 1777. We are in the midst of this great American Revolution, and I am very, very glad that you are here to all volunteer for the cause of His Excellency George Washington. Uh, as you may or may not know, as a general from Connecticut, I have very little time for public audiences. However, there is a bit of a respite in the struggle at the moment. So I am here, and it has come to my attention that many of you in the Virginia colony, which you are all living in, I know that when you do come out into those western territory, for those savage Indians, many of you do not realize where you are, but I certainly do hope that many of you do realize that you are all Virginians. In 1777, there was no such thing as this place that I've heard some of you refer to today as Ohio. I have seen on some native Indian maps the word Ohio referring to a great river, but there is no territory. All of this, so please, uh, Matt, take sort of the surrounding inhabitants of this vicinity or wherever. Thank you very much. Now, as many of you uh, Virginians are aware, we are in the midst of this great struggle, and I would like to give a little bit of pause in which you would all join this cause of Washington and of rebellion. I certainly hope that there are none of you here that are Tories. <laughs> Loyalists, perhaps? Loyal tendencies. Good. Then we're all here for the same cause. Let me introduce myself. My name is David Worcester. I am born was born in Stanford, Connecticut in 1710. I have always been a resident of these colonies, the great colony of Connecticut. In my youth, I attended Yale College. And after some time, not much difficulty, I would add, I courted and wed the Reverend Thomas Clapp's daughter, who Thomas Clapp, as some of you may know, is the president of Yale College. And Mary Clapp and I were married in 1745, we had six children. Um, sad to say, however, that only two of them have survived to adulthood with disease, taking the rest of them in infancy. However, many of you see me in military regalia, and I'm extremely proud of my military prowess in my past. I have served when necessary, served when asked, served when needed. For example, <clears throat> young man, are you afraid in the Virginia Territory of pirates? What? Are you afraid of pirates, man? Pirates! Pirates! pirates? Are you afraid of pirates in the Territory of Virginia that you're in? In the 1730s, young man, <clears throat> let me answer for you. I understand that education in the Virginia Territory is lacking. A pirate, a pirate young man, is a scallywag. A scallywag young man, pay attention young man, a scallywag who sides Spain. In the 1730s, we are greatly perplexed by the news given to us by a one Mr. Jenkins. Have you heard of Mr. Jenkins? <clears throat> Mr. Jenkins was in the British Navy, and British, uh, Mr. Jenkins appeared before the House of Parliament, very, very much dressed like I am, very much longer wig than I have on, and he produced to the House of Parliament something in a pickled jar. Odd shape, to say the least. The Parliament was much perplexed as to what this object was in this pickled jar, and Mr. Jenkins said, it is my ear! Those dastard Spanish severed my ear in the Caribbean. We must go to war with Spain. Now, Oddly enough, no one in the House of Parliament bothered to check if Mr. Jenkins truly had both of his ears or not. <laughs> However, it was a great rally cry and Great Britain went to war with Spain. In this war with Spain, we're commonly referred to in Connecticut as the War of Jenkins' Ear, the state of Connecticut commissioned a sloop of war to be built, the defense. And I was commissioned the first lieutenant of this defense to patrol the coast of Connecticut for two things. The Spanish and pirates. 
And in a year and a half on board the Sloop Defense, I am proud to say that we encountered neither. After the War of Jenkins here, there was still a bit of a tussle now with France. Because you see this small little tussle with Spain quickly enveloped many, many, many other countries. Uh, France, for example. Now, <clears throat> north of us in New England is a small town called Lewisburg. And Lewisburg, militarily, is in a tremendously potential location for travel, occupation, or if you wish to seize all of the French Canadian territory. I was commissioned as a captain of Connecticut Infantry to attack Lewisburg with the British. We attacked and Lewisburg fell in two days. Two days time. Now, I was given command of Lewisburg. Great, great military thing. I was very proud of that. Except we had a large contingency of French prisoners. What do you do with a large group of Frenchmen? Well, obviously you send them back to France, which is what we did. We sent them on board a cartel ship, I was on that ship, and we sailed for France. The French accepted greatly these Frenchmen. We didn't want them. However, they looked me in the face and they said, General, do not even think of embarking on French soil. So I was uh, disinclined to join their party. So I sailed for England, where King George II, the second of the Hanoverian kings of Germany, welcomed me with great, great acclaim. In 1746, while I was in England, I had my portrait painted. I must say, I am a modest and humble man, but that was a pinnacle of my career. To sit and have one's portrait painted in the great galleries of London, madam. Imagine that. The galleries of London. Not Connecticut, not New Haven, not Denver, <laughs> London. It was amazing. The only time I ever sat for a portrait in 1746. The king awarded me a great military honor. Something that I could say that none of my colleagues in Connecticut have ever had bestowed upon me. First of all, in New England, let me, or in England, let me stress the point that we are considered, especially now, as second class citizens. I was awarded by King George II a commission for life as a captain of the 51st Regiment of Foot under Captain Colonel William Pepper. I was given a life commission in the regulars of the British Army. Never before seen and very rarely seen since then. Now, after the war of Jenkins here, I went into private life. My wife and I, several children, lived in New Haven. Had a lovely home there. Went into the mercantile business. My education at Yale College helped out tremendously with that, as well as some inheritance of my father. And oh, by the way, did I mention that not only did I receive the captain's commission, but the king also granted me 3,000 acres in New York. A small, but rather significant piece of land to say here. Now, after, as the French and Indian War approaches, Another great conflict in the colonies. I, of course, enlisted with great pride in His Majesty's forces under Connecticut and fought very, very bravely, I must add, along with William Amherst in Ticonderoga at Quebec. After the war, however, I received bad news. My son Thomas, one of the two surviving sons, had traveled to Ireland and had racked up quite a get as young men often do while they're on their own in foreign lands. My son Thomas had racked up a debt of 1,800 pounds, six, shilling, six shillings, three pence. I had not the money for that. I had to sell that 3,000 acres that the king had given me in New York to myself sail to Ireland and pay the bond to release my son and return home. Many of you, I'm sure, are parents to understand the fact that you would do most anything for your children, especially when they are locked up and incarcerated in faraway prisons. Now, as time would have it, we have a rather lengthy stretch of time, from about 1755 to 1763, 
1775. After the French and Indian War, I retired once more to private life. Now, I would not at all be up here to gloat on my personal achievements. I would not be at all up here to boast upon my individual propriety on the idea of revolution and independence, but heed this. In 1763, as far as income is concerned, my father passed away. Fortunately, God rest his soul. My father passed away and I received a large patrimony. My mercantile business is booming. My land sales, well, we won't talk about my land sales. I am also the royal customs official in New Haven, a tax collector, if you will, for His Majesty King George III. And my wife uh, was not at all short on uh, funds, if you will, when we were wed. I have no need whatsoever to fall into this pit, as some have called it, of revolution. None whatsoever, madam. Would you say that I have any cause as a pauper to throw it all away for a mere cause of independence? Not at all. As a tax collector, I see the horrible disdain amongst my fellow citizens of Connecticut that their taxes are too high. We are adjacent to Massachusetts, our sister colony, and Massachusetts, which has bore the brunt of the tyranny of the king, has called for our help. What other, what other course could I possibly take? In 1775, when the war broke out in Boston, some call it the hotbed of agitators. Samuel Adams, John Hancock, all of these agitators, madam, do you know who I'm talking of? Agitators, as they call them, the Tories, the loyalists who have no cause for this independence, would rather sit fat and comfortable in their homes, which I could have done had the cause not been the white right cause. In 1775, when Connecticut raised its arms to defend its fellows in Massachusetts, I answered the call and am awarded the commission of a major general in Connecticut. In the latter part of 1775, the Continental Congress gather in Philadelphia and they commission eight new brigadier generals in this Continental Army. George Washington, of course, His Excellency, is given the commander-in-chief status of the entire force. Silman, Montgomery, and myself are the first three brigadier generals of the American Continental Army commissioned by the Continental Congress in 1775. Now, some of you may know of General Montgomery. He has long since passed. General Montgomery being a very brave man, finding his respite at the Siege of Quebec in 1776. Upon his death, I have taken his place in Quebec, and I will get to that in a minute because that causes me much frustration and much agitation. Not because of the campaign, no. Not because of the men that were fighting under me, no, no, no. Those who are political in nature, madam. Those who are political in nature, who are bent on their own personal, personal greed, their own personal convictions, their own personal glory, unlike the rest of us who are here for the cause of liberty and independence. Before I went to join the forces in Quebec, I was stationed in New York. And my duty in New York was to make certain that the British do not land at Long Island. Now, some have laughed at this bit of an inquiry. While in New York, my main job was to make certain that the British or the loyalists there did not steal the cattle on Long Island and send them to the entrapped British in Boston. Because remember, at this time, General Washington has surrounded Boston in the Boston Heights and had the British penned in in Boston. So instead, we took the cattle, sheep, hay, provisions, sent them to His Excellency on the Boston Heights for hours, but not there. There was a gentleman his name escapes me because he was a Tory loyalist and I care not who he was. He was a printer by trade in New York. 
while we were there. And the New York legislature, by the way, madam, have you ever been to New York? Nothing happens in New York. The legislature of New York does nothing. The legislature of New York cannot make a decision. And I, there for the cause of Connecticut, Governor Trumbull of Connecticut, send me there with my men. I totally have my hands tied. There's nothing that I can do. They want me here. They want me there. They want more men. They want me here. It was agitated. But back to this printer, a Tory loyalist in New York. We arrested him because he was printing non-truths about the patriotic cause. Not only did we arrest him, we captured all of his typeset, and we melted it down, and promptly made bullets out of oil. Now, some of you may recall, if you had traveled to New York, prior to the war, there was a great equestrian statue of George III, which the Patriots promptly tore down in 1775. This statue was sent to Danbury, Connecticut, for one purpose, not to decorate anyone's home. The statue, by the way, was made of lead. We melted it down and proceeded to make bullets out of that as well. Now, back to General Montgomery in Quebec. Do you have more? I am not wasting anyone's time, and I guess <laughs> we're fascinated. General Montgomery was a good man. He was a good soldier. He was a good friend of mine. But there are some who come up with political ambitions, like Philip Schuler, who was a congressman from New York. From New York, Madam New York. Continental Congress gave him a commission as a Major General of the Forces in 1775 and the Commander of the Forces in Quebec. I, of course, superseded him when I took Montgomery's place, and he did nothing but write letters to Washington, to Hancock, to other generals, to governors, complaining, madam, about me. And none of them, none of them were true. Madam, you seem like a lovely lady, a lovely lady. May I confer with you? I am in this for the cause. Never once for my personal ambition or glory. But that man, that man was in it for every wrong reason in there. I resigned. I left my commission. The British were reinforced in Quebec in the late summer. I had neither manpower, I had neither money. Congress wouldn't send any. The local inhabitants refused to accept credit any longer, and I don't blame them. Smallpox ravaged my men. We had no medicine. The British were reinforced, and we were driven back. I resigned, and I called on John Hancock to open an inquiry into my conduct, and the entire Continental Congress acquitted me. John Adams, John Adams, soft. I have no patience for that. His Excellency George Washington supported me entirely. And now, as we roll into the early months of 1777, I have just returned from New York once again, where I have made certain the loyalists have no sense of propriety in New York. Now, I am about ready, at the moment, to return to Connecticut. Word has added, my wife has sent a letter to me that I need to address. General, Mr. Singh. Excuse me. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I must beg your forgiveness. This letter just came in from Governor Trumbull of our fair colony, Connecticut. It appears that the loyalist governor of New York, the traitor, General Triumph, it has landed 2,000 men south of Elizabeth Bay, south of my hometown of New Haven and Danbury, where we have at this moment a large stash of goods stored. So if you will excuse me, uh, my time has been well spent with you. We need men. We need men. We need ladies. We need all the forces that we can possibly accumulate if we are to defeat this traitor's girl, this giant in trouble who has done everything in his power to destroy the cause. If you will excuse, excuse me, though, I must make haste for Connecticut. I bid you farewell. I had to kind of laugh. I'm ashamed to say that myself, probably most of you here, the only thing that you know of 
General David Worcester because there's a pain not even in the coffee house. <laughs> Am I wrong? No. I didn't even know that. In <laughs> Excellent. In 1777, General Worcester is uh, called, just as that letter read, by the governor, he and Benedict Arnold, who he hated, by the way. Benedict Arnold was 35 years his younger and very cocky and very pretentious. He and Benedict Arnold and General Stillman went to attack General Tryon outside of, um, outside of Danbury. As General Worcester attacked the rear guard of the British, he went to rally his troops and was struck down with a 69 caliber ball about the size of my thumb in his side, which shattered his backbone and lodged into his stomach. He died four days later in rhythming agony. He was buried immediately. Three people attended his funeral. One was a black slave about the age of this boy right here. In 1858, the citizens of Connecticut decided, you know, we need to do something for this great patriot hero of our state. Let's erect a monument. Let's re-enter him. Let's give him a proper funeral. But we don't know where he is. This black slave boy is now an old man. I do remember. And he pointed the location when they dug the spot. Metallic fringe from epaulets were found. A 69 caliber ball was found around the area of the backbone of the stomach, and the skeletal remains had a shattered spine. So General Worcester in 1858 received full military funeral, full military regalia, and is now proudly buried in Danbury, Connecticut. If you get a chance, take a look at the flags. These two flags are patterned after originals that General Worcester carried. This is one found in the Danbury Museum, and this is one that was his regimental flag. It carries the memorial seal of the colony of Connecticut on one side, and because Massachusetts was their sister colony, and to show their total support for Massachusetts, the motto, an appeal to heaven, which is the motto of Massachusetts, is put on the back, which is a quote from John Locke in his second treatise on government. So, there'll be a test on this tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> what is the significance of General Worcester and Worcester, Ohio? That's a very good question and not one that's easy to answer. Because in 1779, New Haven, Connecticut is burned to the ground by the British. And all of General Worcester's family papers are destroyed when his home is destroyed. Um, because of that raid, Connecticut, which originally extended well west into what is now North Ohio and Indiana, had an area called the Western Reserve. Subsequently, if any of you ever wish to do any research on Connecticut and the Revolution, there are two places to go. The uh, Connecticut State Library in Connecticut or the Western Reserve Historical Society in Cleveland. They have more, they actually have more records there than they have in Connecticut. Subsequently, these individuals who were burned out in Connecticut were given land grants in the east, or the west. Not all of them came, but some of them did. And those that did come were relatives or veterans of General Worcester's regiment in the war. And as they moved further south, that's the best that we have as a, as a total clincher cinch to that connection. Unfortunately, I wish I could give you a better, more solid, like this guy was here and he did that, and that's why I do not. All right, thank you very much for your time and your